Okay, I'm here with uh, my friend, Dr. John uh, Peckham, and we are excited to talk about his uh, brand new book, God With Us, an introduction to Adventist uh, theology. If you uh, have been a part of the Advent Hope community, you know that we've talked about this book a lot. In fact, our current sermon series, we're using the book as an outline for the sermons and then taking passages and and exposing those passages. So it's been a fun time. Uh, John, it's so great to have you here with us. Thank you for being here. And thank you for writing this book and all the other books you've been writing. Um, John, maybe if we can start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now. I know you're there in in Maryland, where your new role is there, and uh, anything else that might be relevant about uh, what's happening in your life. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, as you just mentioned, uh, my family and I uh, just moved to Maryland. I have a wonderful wife, Brenda, and one son, uh, Joel, and we just moved to Maryland uh, because I just took up a a new position uh, at the Adventist Review as associate editor there. I still remain a research professor at Andrews, so I'm still part of the seminary at Andrews University and will still be doing research and writing as I've been doing, uh, but also doing some more uh, popular level writing and editing uh, in in the Adventist Review venue. That's fantastic. Well, I usually have an uh, Oriole hat uh, nearby that I can put on. I don't have mine today, but you can see in the background. In the back, so, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, that's always... Say, Oriole fan in New York? I mean... <laughs> that's right. How, yeah. how are you throwing that off? <laughs> it, you know, you know, you gotta you, you gotta be in... Uh, in, in uh, well, I love New Yorkers, but in that case, we do not agree on the Yankees <laughs> the situation or the Mets. So, uh, Oriole <laughs> fan. So, I'm going to come down and we'll go to a game sometime. Yeah, so... 20 minutes north. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Perfect. I don't know if you're a fan yet, but I'm going to try to make you an Oriole fan. <laughs> uh, so, John, yeah, man, we're excited to talk about the book. Again, we've been uh, discussing it in our sermon series, but it, glad to hear from you personally. So thank you uh, for being on with us. And the first question is just what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, the, the idea for the book actually came uh, from outside. I was invited a number of years ago uh, by the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference to write a textbook on Adventist theology for our undergraduate colleges and universities around the world. And so they invited me uh, to work on this project, and I accepted that invitation. And as I was uh, thinking about doing this, this massive task, and as I sat down to actually uh, try to do it, uh, I was incredibly daunting, of course, so involved a lot of prayer, a lot of thought. But then I also wanted to be something that wasn't just restricted to the classroom. And so I wanted to, as I was writing at a level uh, for, for undergraduate classroom, uh, that's already less academic than my other books. All my books at this point have been uh, thoroughly academic books with academic presses. And this book needed to be targeting uh, all the way down to like a freshman level uh, college student, uh, which requires that you're not going to be using a lot of jargon, or if you do, you have to introduce it and, and keep reminding the reader of it. And as I was setting it up, I thought, you know, I'd really love this to be a resource for for everyone who wants to know about the beauty of Adventist theology, right? And so these ideas just kept coming to my head, right? I want I want to emphasize the beauty of Adventism, and I want it to be accessible theology or theology for everyone. Mm. Anyone can pick up this book, whether they have an Adventist background or, or even if they don't, um, but even if even if they have an Adventist background, can can come and get a an even deeper understanding of not just the the particular doctrines that Adventists believe, but how they fit together in a grand, beautiful story that's actually greater than the sum of its parts. And I didn't know of anything. Maybe there are, there are things out there, so I'm not trying to disparage anything that's out there. Uh, but I wanted to, to provide something that is kind of all in one place, not that it's comprehensive. We have to be selective, even, even, in, even in a larger book like this one. Uh, but that you can you can see how the doctrines fit together in this grand biblical story of redemption, the story of the God who loves us and wants to be with us more than we can possibly imagine, and his his quest to restore this relationship with us. And so I tried to weave that throughout the entire book, where you have some elements of narrative uh, that go back and forth with the doctrinal material, so that it's always situated within this grand story of the God who who is with us and wants to be even even more with us or with us in a more intimate way than he is now. 
That's beautiful. So the the title is includes the the phrase God with us. Um so yeah, what what made you choose this as a a theme? Yeah. So as I was as I was thinking about this, uh, how do I frame this? How do I frame Abinus doctrines uh in a way that would be that would be cohesive and would fit with the biblical storyline. And there are many scholars who who believe now that the central theme of scripture is the presence of God. Hmm. And I had already um, been dealing with that in a lot of my own work. A lot of my work had been on the love of God um, and very closely related to that is God's desire to be with us and a God who is present in a way that isn't always the case in some other theological systems where uh, it's a different kind of God who is transcendent, uh, that is completely beyond us and our our sphere of living, uh, but it's not imminent, is not is not with us, and it really can't be by the mm. nature of the God who He is. But the biblical God is quite different. You have the biblical God who is transcendent; He is beyond all creaturely reality, but He also is and can be and wants to be with us and is love. And so, this story of God's presence actually follows the storyline of Scripture. You have creation where where God is intimately with humans that he creates, but then you have the fall that disrupts this presence with us. And most of the story of scripture is the story of God's quest to restore this relationship that is ruptured by the fall, by sin, by evil, so that he can be with us again in fullness in the way he intended from the beginning. And that, of course, is 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 the eschatology, the last things, the restoration of everything in the second coming and beyond. Uh, so that's that's the broad scope of the biblical story. But then when it comes to Adventism specifically, the the unique or or they're not entirely unique doctrines, but the doctrines that are uniquely essential to Adventism are some of them, I should say, are themselves gathered around this theme of God's presence when you think about it. So if you take mm. the name Seventh Day Adventist, you have two of those themes right there, right? You have the Sabbath, which has been described uh, by Abraham Heschel and others as a temple in time, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a time that's set apart for us to be with God in a special way and for God to be with us in a special way, right? This the Sabbath where you 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 come apart from the worries and uh, the business of the world and the stresses of the world to actually commune with God in dedicated time, which of course is, is a beautiful message for our day and age that we live in now. Uh, but I don't want to dig digress about that too much at the moment. But you have so you have the Sabbath, right? So this is God with us in time, with a special like like a date where He wants to be with us and wants us to to focus our attention on Him and and others uh, that that we love in relationship to Him. So you have the Sabbath there on the seventh day, and then you have Adventist, which is about the second coming which is the restoration of God's personal, intimate presence with us in fullness that has been broken. And it's not in the name, but closely related to that is, uh, which is also uh, uniquely essential to Adventist theology, is the sanctuary, which is a temple in space. Mm. And that sanctuary, if you understand it, is actually uh, it's doing more than this. I don't want to reduce it to this, but it is actually describing the process by which God makes a way so that he can be with us despite the fact that we have broken the relationship with him through sin and evil. So this is his way of cleaning everything up, cleaning up the mess that we have made, uh, cleaning up the mess of the world that we are in so that we can be with him in a way that restores everything uh, back, uh, back to the way he wanted it to be in the beginning in his love. And so you, you see this constellation of themes and there are others, and they all relate to this theme of the God who wants to be with us. And last, but certainly not least, I wanted the book to start with Jesus. I wanted to start with Christ, right? Uh, because this is where God and humanity meet in its pinnacle, right? God actually becomes human. And unfortunately, those of us who, who have been Christian for a long time, I think we tend to not realize how shocking that is, right? We are familiar, so familiar with that idea of the incarnation of, of, of God becoming human in Jesus that it doesn't shock us anymore. But this is about as shocking as anything could be. And I wanted to start there. And that is just one of the names for Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, right? And so at the very center of the story is the God who is love that is manifest in Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he doesn't just say, I want to be with you. He doesn't just call himself God with us. He becomes God with us in the flesh in Christ. So I could go on and on, but that's a little bit of, of what I was thinking with the theme. Wow, it's, it's so good. Yeah, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, thinking about the transcendent side, I know there's always the argument about uh, whether God exists in time or not, when you think about the transcendence 
So what I hear you saying is uh, that the Sabbath in particular kind of uh, settles that argument that God yes. does exist in time with us, right? Yes, be both, the Sabbath, both the Sabbath and the sanctuary. So you yeah. have the Sabbath where there's this time that's set apart with us. And then you have the sanctuary where there is some kind of sequential process that God is doing. Mm. That actually makes a difference in the world. And there's a, a sequences in the atonement, right? You have the cross event, you have the resurrection, but you also have the ascension, right? And even for those who may not understand what Adventists teach about the, the, the full-blown doctrine of the sanctuary, which is often misunderstood even by Adventists, right? Many Adventists yeah. unfortunately have heard that doctrine is bad news when actually it is the best of good news. Yeah. Because what they're afraid of in the sanctuary is judgment. And most people, if I ask you, do you want to be judged? You're probably going to say no, right? Uh <laughs> And that's why we, we tend to think of it negatively. But in scripture, judgment is a wonderful thing because the judge is the deliverer. It's the one who is coming to right all wrongs, the one who is to, to turn what's upside down, right side up again, to bring justice, to restore those who are oppressed, the poor, the widows, the orphans. And so in scripture, the prophets are not crying out, God, why do you judge so much? They're crying out, God, why don't you bring judgment more often and more swiftly mm. because of the restoration that comes with us? And that's only one part, one small part of this doctrine of the sanctuary. But when Christ ascends, he actually uh, is, it, there's this, this beautiful scene uh, in heaven, in the heavenly court in, in Revelation 5, where you have John reduced to tears because there's this question, who is worthy to open the scrolls? And another way of, of framing that question in a way we might understand it better is who is worthy to rule? Who's worthy to restore the rule that, that Adam and Eve had lost in the fall? Who's worthy to actually resolve the, the, the problems of the world? And at first, no one's worthy. No one is found. And so John is reduced to tears because all hope is lost. But then the lamb who is slain is the one who is mm. worthy. And he's installed in heaven in this work where he always lives to make intercession for us. And so even though we're in this world that's a, a mess, and it, and it is a mess, uh, there is one in heaven who is interceding on our behalf and is doing everything that is necessary to right all wrongs and bring everything back to, to the original intention. So all that requires time as well. And a God who is not restricted by time in the way we are, but a God who actually does things in history, in the incarnation, and continues to do things for us. Uh, the, how else can he be with us in the way the Bible describes? Well, that's th fantastic. And I, I want to uh, schedule another time and talk more in more detail about the sanctuary in particular, because I think, yeah, that you, I mean, you, you, uh, you nailed it there, but we could talk more because I do, it's definitely one of those uh, areas that, has caused a lot of confusion absolutely so, um or at least or, or apathy maybe uh yes. even more than confusion so um so i do actually want to talk a little bit more you've hit on a couple of the big ones when it comes to you know the unique avenus teachings before though we get further into that i want to just back up and say that you know we know that avenus hold much in common with other protestant denominations in particular um in your book what things did you find that were most interesting in the commonalities between Christians. And I, by the way, I love how you, you know, you did definitely use the narrative overall for the big thing, but you took time in each chapter to wrestle with some of the divergent ideas about any particular uh, teaching. So maybe if you can talk about those things that we do hold in, in common that were really interesting to you and how you uh, kind of wrestled with the, the diversity of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. And, and, and the interesting part is that even among Protestants, there's a lot of diversity, Yeah, <laughs> as you know. Um, so I think the idea that resonates, I should say the ideas, I'm going to mention a couple that resonate the most with me is really the roots of the Protestant Reformation, uh, which is this return to the sources, back to the sources, particularly the sources that come from God, particularly the source of scripture, right? And so you have this idea that uh, we need to have our understanding of God, our understanding of salvation, our understanding of the church, our understanding of everything reformed, right? And that idea of reformed is, is for it to be restored, right? Mm -hmm. To be in a, in a sense renewed or returned uh, to the truth that comes from God rather than truths that maybe are still there. Some of them have been rejected. Some of them are still there, but they're in the trappings of, of, of tradition. Uh, of a tradition that is not always in step with what has come from God. And so this return to scripture, to, to finding the biblical God, um, this I think is the theme that resonates the most with me. And I think it's one of the themes and we'll, I'll talk, talk more about this maybe later on. Uh, but one of the themes that I think 
uh, resonates or or would resonate the most with many people even on the street today, uh, because there's so many ideas about God and mm-hmm. who God is and how God relates to the world. So many ideas about the church and institutions, people that have been damaged by church institutions, right? Uh, people that have been uh, the ways that the name of God and the process of salvation have been commandeered and used almost as a weapon of oppression or abuse or even violence in the history of, of wars and religious wars. All of those things, when, when people are asked about God and Christianity, if they're historically informed at all, or maybe even if they're not, they might have negative views in their mind already, right? And so there's a process of renewal and restoration that needs to take place, uh, not not just at the level of of uh, pointing fingers, but the level of actually saying to somebody, well, let me put it a different way. Many people, um, they might not believe in God, but if I was to ask them, who is the God that you don't believe in? Mm. Or describe to me the God that you don't mm. believe in. And they started describing that God, more often than not, I would be able to say something like, I don't believe in that God either, <laughs> but the God <laughs> of the Bible is different. Or if, or if they said, Christianity is not for me, right? Is this or that? I would also be able to say, you know what? That's not the kind of Christianity that I believe in or practice either. Uh, true Christianity is following Christ. And if you're going to follow Christ, you follow the way that he lived and acted. And the teachings that he gave throughout scripture, which he himself, uh, in the book I describe this, he confirms the Old Testament because he fulfills all of that. He confirms the Old Testament and he commissions the New Testament in the apostolic witness to Christ. And so th- this is what it means to be a Christian. And none of us are doing it perfectly by any means. And so the focus should not be on us, but but on Christ. But to really be a Christian or a follower of Christ, and an Adventist in the best sense, is to follow Christ, to follow the Lamb wherever he leads, which is which easier said than done. Uh, but there's a joy in the journey as well, rather than a, a destination. So mm. those are some things that come to mind for now. Yeah, that's so good. And I do want to come back to the idea of, of, of talking to other people about our faith, because I do think that's a a challenge for a lot of uh, Christians and and Avenus, and you kind of summarize it so perfectly there. So as to what we can communicate, but let, so let's come to back to that in a moment. Uh, so you were talking there about the the kind of the generalities that Christians uh, that that you you found intriguing that we hold in common. You mentioned earlier about kind of the beautiful side of some Avenus theology, and you've mentioned Sabbath, you've mentioned sanctuary. Are there any other elements of kind of our unique Avenist teachings that you found to really jump out uh, as you were preparing this? Yeah, and here again, it would I don't it would be an overstatement if I was to say this teaching I'm going to talk about now is entirely unique or in some way yeah, I'm fair. Yes. To Adventism. Uh, yes. But I would use the phrase uh, I would say that it's uniquely essential to Adventism, and the one okay. that that points out, in addition to the ones that I, that I've alluded to already, this idea uh, of the cosmic conflict, or what Adventists yeah. call the Great Controversy, and this this cosmic conflict and Great Controversy helps gives us a framework. Doesn't answer all of our questions by any means, but gives us a framework to understand how God can be love and God can be good in all the ways that Scripture describes Him, uh, and yet there is so much evil in the world. So much horrendous evil, so much pain, so much suffering, so much violence, so many horrible things that, again, it's not hard to see why someone on the street or even someone in the pews might be thinking, looking around at the world. I mean, this was me when I was a kid, right? I'm looking around the world and I'm like, I believe in loving God, but what's going on around Mm. here? This is why I became Mm. a theologian, because I was wrestling with these questions as long as I can remember. It's not hard to, to understand why somebody would say, okay, the world's like this, but you say God's all powerful. Okay, so he would have the power to stop all these things, right? At least theoretically. He's entirely good, so he shouldn't want any of these things to be happening, right? right? Uh, so so what's going on here? And he's, he's not ignorant. He knows everything, so he, he certainly knows what's happening. So so how can these things fit together, right? And that's known as the problem of evil, and it's the biggest question in people's minds inside the church or outside of the church. And the cosmic conflict, uh, the story of the cosmic conflict, which is a thoroughly biblical story. I've tried to show that. And I, and I, and I also use that as part of the framework in this book, God with us. I tried to show that this, this is just the story of redemption in scripture provides a beautiful picture. Doesn't answer all of our questions, uh, provides a beautiful picture though, of how to wrestle with some of these very difficult questions. 
It's so good because it uh, the the cosmic conflict idea is also kind of a, it is a narrative. So mm-hmm. it's our our Avenus, uh theological history really does go back to this issue of narrative, which again you're using in in the book God with us. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm impressed by the narrative nature and that you know sometimes uh, when presented. Uh, Christian and Avenist doctrine, we do it and it's kind of all over the place. And you, you know, you one week you're talking about, you know, why sh- you should be healthy. And the next week you're talking about, you know, Jesus coming again, but really it fits as a narrative, right? So that our, our history is narrative. Yes. Yes. If we're doing it right, it's all part of this grand story that happens to be, I think the true story of all reality and the greatest story that has ever been told and ever could be told if we're understanding it. And so all those things need to fit together. And so if people if people look at a copy of the book, they'll see that the first three chapters, especially the first two, are really just retelling the story of Scripture. Mm-hmm. And those who are very familiar with the script, with the story, they don't have to read those. Maybe they'll want to read it and revisit again. But they did that on purpose because they came across many people, even students that I had had, had who didn't know the story. And so then when you try to teach them doctrines, right, they're just points of information. That right. are just hanging out there, right? And yeah. even if you do it in an exciting way, I mean, I know, sadly, I mean, I love theology. I'm a theologian, but I know that sometimes the way theology is taught or the way that it's communicated comes off as dry and boring. I don't think it is at all. I think that's something wrong with the communication or maybe the theology itself when that happens. Uh, but but it's that. And then and then if you take it outside of the, the idea of story, th- there's like nothing for them to connect with. And it's just like points of information. But, but that's not what doctrine is or should be at all. All of these points, which are beautiful points of doctrine, they're part of the story of a living God who loves us more than we could possibly imagine, uh, loves us enough to, in Christ, become human and die for us and give his life for us, suffer more than anyone ever has suffered. And not just in the incarnation, he suffers whenever we suffer. That kind of God, the story of his relationship with us and the desire to have a relationship with us, I tried to weave that through the the entire book. Um, and again, in a way that is accessible theology. It, it, it is a long book, but I tried to make it extremely readable and digestible. Mm-hmm. I don't know how well I succeeded. Readers can be the judge of that. But that was my intention, that anyone can pick it up and follow it and hopefully enjoy reading it and see, wow, I've never seen how these things how these things fit together this way before. Uh, I had a number of students when I taught um, at the undergraduate level a number of years ago, where uh, when I was teaching a class called Christian Beliefs, which walked through Adventist theology. And I remember some of them at the beginning of the class, they would, you know, it was a required class. It was kind of like, well, I've I've been at Adventist my entire life. So it was clear that they were there, you know, they thought it, it, they didn't really need to be there. And so I would always just kind of wink and smile and say, well, you know, I hope you might learn something at least in the class. And then later in the class, those same people, those same students I remember came back to me and they're like, why didn't anybody ever teach us this? <laughs> They've been having us their whole life. They, they grew up in the church. Why didn't anybody ever teach us these things? And I never had had an answer as to why they hadn't seen it before. But but when I sat down to write this book, I remember those students and others. And I thought, well, hopefully people will be exposed to at least some of these things that I've had the privilege of being taught by others um, I stand on the shoulders of, of, of a lot of other people. Of course, any faults in the book are mine, uh, but I've had the privilege of learning from a lot of wonderful teachers. And so hopefully uh, that beauty of this biblical story of redemption, the beauty of Adventist theology uh, comes through in the book. Well, I, I can affirm that for, certainly for my reading, I found it to be the case and I have recommended the book widely and heard many others who are really appreciative of it. So it, it, it did strike me, it was a little ironic uh, about the, you know, the narrative nature and how that hasn't always been our way of communicating things in that uh, Genesis one and two and three, which Adventists take to heart, that it really starts with in the beginning, which is your classic way of starting a story. So uh, it, it's narrative right off the bat. And, uh, and and certainly the end of Revelation is the same way. So the bookends are there. The story is is there. Um, I did want to spend a little time again coming back to this idea of uh, of of communicating with others um, and and how the book helps with that. I know that's an issue for for a lot of people who maybe want to communicate with friends or family about Christianity or Christ or even Adventism. 
and and they're not sure how to do this. I think the book gives a framework for that. You did speak specifically about the problem of evil, which I personally found here in New York to be the issue when someone says that they have given up on faith or you know, never embrace faith. It often comes back to this issue of the world is a terrible place and atrocities are happening. And of course, we're uh, two weeks from a brand new war in uh, in Israel and Gaza taking place. So I appreciate you mentioning that. I wonder if you can, uh, this issue of problem of evil, if you can expound on that and maybe other ways as people do think about how they might communicate uh, why faith does work and makes sense, how you feel like what you've written in the book can be helpful toward that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Let me say a couple of things. First, first I want to say that I think many people struggle with sharing their faith with others because they're afraid that they're going to get asked questions they don't know the answer to, or that they're not going to have, have anything to share. And, and to that, I wanted to say two things. I always uh, have told my students um, that one of the things I try to accomplish in the classes that I've taught is I use the metaphor of a well. And for them to fill their well deeply so that when they're doing ministry and when they're reaching out to others, they have that in them already. And so when they're talking with others, they they might know what they believe and why they believe it so well that when they're talking with others, they're not thinking about what's the answer to that question, but they're thinking about what's the best way to communicate it to this person and the question mm. of like where they are in their life right now. So you can actually focus on them and having that discussion rather than the kind of fear of, I don't know what I'm going to say. And number two, and this is maybe the biggest key is that it's okay to just say, I don't know. Right. Yeah. If you don't know, I don't know. No one should fault you for that. I don't know, but let's go look for the study. It's much worse to pretend, you know, everything mm. and then try to make up answers as you go. That was my right. favorite answer in every class I've ever taught. When students ask me a question, I don't know. Right. There's some things I think about it, uh, but, but I, there are many things we don't know, and that's okay. But there are many things that we do, that we do know, and we can know with confidence, and many beautiful truths that I think just just the commitment to filling our well in, in whatever whatever way is available to us uh, within our life. I know people have many different stressors and things pulling them different way, different ways. Uh, but a way that we can actually know what we believe and why we believe it, so that we're equipped to have those kinds of conversations in a very ironic, non-threatening way. Um, and, and in fact, I found that the more you understand what you believe in, why the less defensive hmm. it, 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 I shouldn't say this is true for everyone, but I think it, it's much easier to be less defensive when yeah. you're confident, right. Then when you, when you, you feel threatened by every question, because you're like, oh, maybe that is going to undermine, undermine what I believe, or I don't have, a, I, I don't, I've never thought about that before. I think for me, the more studying I've done, of course, there's things that I've understood that I've come to understand that I was wrong about before. Uh, yeah. But there are other things that have been just, just more strengthened. And so uh, you can have kind of a conversation that is much more welcoming and open in a way that can actually focus on how, how can I actually have a dialogue with this person that's actually going to be meaningful to them in their life and where they are right now. When it comes to the problem of evil, um, I think the scripture just provides this, this cosmic conflict framework. And I would just sum it up in just a few points, right? There are, there are many things that we do not know. That's point number one, right? Many things we do not know and, and that we shouldn't expect to have all the answers to. So when it comes to the problem of evil, this is in the, in the story of Job, in other places, there's things going on and we just sometimes don't know what we don't know. And we should always remember that even if, even if we said, nothing else. And the fact that I don't know the answer doesn't mean there isn't an answer, right? And I, I always tell, I'll try to be brief with this, but I always often tell the story of my son who had a, a, a medical condition and he had to be tested to see if he needed to have some, some really aggressive treatment. Um, and so he had to be, you know, had to have a blood draw. And he was very young. He was less than two, two years old. He couldn't even, couldn't even talk at the time. And we had to hold, the nurse asked us to hold him down so she could, you know, stick him in and, and draw the blood. And I'll never forget the look in his eyes. And it was, mm, you know, mm. if I was to verbalize it, daddy, why are you doing this? Or why are you allowing this to happen? Mm. To you? And there's nothing that I could say at the time that he would have understood mm -hmm. why I was doing what I was doing. But what I was doing was only out of love and only for his good. And there wasn't any preferable avenue available to me. So the fact that we might not be in, in a position to understand mm. all of what's going on doesn't mean there aren't good answers. Uh, but we can say much more than that because the Bible is also very clear that God does not 
always get what he wants. Very often things happen that God does not want to have happen. Now, how is that possible if God is all powerful? It's possible if God has committed himself to allow creatures to have free will. Well, then you might say, why would God give creatures free will if they're going to misuse it and it leads to all this kind of evil? Well, if he didn't give creatures free will, we couldn't love. And love is just the greatest value in the universe. And it's actually central to who God is. So arguably, God couldn't do otherwise if he's going to be love and if we're going to be able to enter into relationship with love. So if that's true, you have this, this free will. And when people misuse their free will or when they choose against God's love is the simplest way to, to define evil, I found, then that's where evil comes from. But it's not up to God whether creatures are going to misuse that freedom. Because if he was to control everything they did, they wouldn't actually have the kind of freedom that is necessary for love. That's much more complicated the discussion that goes along with that. Uh, but I'm just putting this in, in outline for now. Uh, but even that doesn't answer all of our questions, free will, because it seems like there's a lot of evils in the world that an all-powerful God could prevent without undermining anyone's free will. There's a lot he couldn't, but there's a lot of others that it seems like he could, right? Like so-called natural disasters, plane crashes. I mean, all kinds of things you could think of that you could say, well, it would seem like he could intervene there. And here's where the Bible paints a, a much bigger conflict going on in the background, which is often unseen, which Avanus often call the great controversy or the cosmic conflict, that there is a struggle between not just, uh, there's not just human free will involved, there is an entire realm of celestial creatures, commonly known as angels and demons. And demons are, are part of a rebellion mm -hmm. against God and against God's character. Now, when people first hear this, they say, again, how could that be? How could there be any conflict between an all-powerful God and any creatures, demons or otherwise? How could they have any power against God? And this could only be the case if the conflict is not a conflict of sheer power, there could be no conflict, but if the conflict is one of a different kind, a conflict of character, right? And that's what we find that it is. All the way from the beginning of the story to the end, you have the enemy, the devil, uh, which the, the Greek word just, just relates to slander, mm -hmm. who is raising lies about God's character because he wants to be in the place of God himself. Mm -hmm. And he does this in the Garden of Eden, where he tries to convince Eve that God is lying to her, that he doesn't really want what is best for her. And all throughout the story, he is slandering God's character. Well, there's you cannot defeat slander by sheer power. Right? If a, if if the governor of if the if I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the governor, if the mayor of New York City, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular. Um, yeah. if the <laughs> if, if the mayor of any city is accused of corruption, how much power would they need to exercise to clear their name? There's the more, no amount, right? Yeah. The more they use their power, the more likely it is mm. going to make them look more guilty. Mm. And so if at the center of this conflict, there is a question over God's character that God is answering, not for his own benefit, but because if he doesn't answer it, there can never be this kind of love relationship, right? If you think about it for a moment, if you have a spouse or a significant other or a best friend, and somebody tells you they're the worst person in the world, they did all these things. If you even enter entertain that idea, it's going to break your relationship. And then if you come to believe it, you can never have the kind of, of, of deep, intimate love relationship uh, that is best. So God is answering this, not just, not, not for his sake, but for our sake. And the mm -hmm. only way to answer this is by an actual demonstration mm -hmm. of his love and who he is that defeats those allegations at the level of creatures' minds. And this is what is done in the plan of salvation. At the pinnacle is the cross, where God gives himself on the cross. And even if everything else I've said, and I'm just giving an outline, so there's so much more uh, that to, to back up these different points. But even if we couldn't say anything else, if you just look at a God who is willing to lower himself and give himself on the cross, if there was any other way, surely he would have chosen it. That kind of God can be trusted. A God who is willing to suffer with us and for us, even if we know nothing else. And it's in the cross and beyond that God demonstrates that he's truly love, that he's truly good. And his love through the cross and beyond, actually overturns and counteracts all the evil in the world until it is all eventually going to be removed and every tear will be will be wiped away. All things will be made new and evil will never rise again. Now that's a very poor explanation of what I call the odyssey of love in just a few points. And I know people might be listening and say, but there's a, there's a question I have here, the question I have here. Believe me, I know there's like a whole constellation of questions. And I try to address those in, in, in story form in an understandable way in, in, in the chapter 
one chapter deals with this specifically, but the other chapters also provide supporting material about who this God is. So I understand it's an impoverished explanation, but that's kind of the outline. Uh, but there's much more to it than, than what I was able to, to lay out there. Well, you you uh, uh, are alluding to another book also that you wrote. And in fact, the first book I read of yours and where I was like, I, I love this guy and this is so helpful was uh, The Odyssey of, of Love is the title what that was written back a few years uh right uh yeah, published yeah. In 2018 by baker there is so definitely worth checking out and in fact we actually did a uh here at avid hope we did a sermon series around that book so we we love you john we're we're a big fans uh <laughs> back during the pandemic when everyone was really uh wrestling with these issues of what's going on in the world um unfortunately that hasn't changed we're still wrestling with these issues but um so many good things. I could talk to you all day and I'm serious about that. So I thank you for taking the time though today. So many other questions I'm sure we have that are coming up. So many other things I would love to ask, and maybe we can do this again at some point. And I know you're just down there in Maryland. So John, maybe we can figure out some time to have you come up to uh, New York and hang out with us. Uh, we got some great food up here. I don't know if you've heard and we'll, we'll take good care of you, but thank you for taking the time. I mean, I, again, I want to keep going, but, uh, we, we, uh, we've used a lot of your time already. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for this uh, new book. So I've, I've heard that it's sold out the first printing sold out of the book, uh, God with us, but I'm assuming more is to come, right? They're, they're doing a second printing. They're doing a, a second printing right now as we speak, and it should be available within a matter of weeks, if not sooner. Okay, so if anyone goes on and is like, I want to get the book and can't find it, just hang in there because it will be available and it's at Amazon. And is Amazon the best place to get it or what? What? how can how you get it? Amazon get or directly from Andrews University Press. Um, if you, Either way, if you do it from Andrews University Press, you can pre-order it. And once the shipment comes in, they'll ship it directly to you. Uh, Amazon, they might have a few copies left. Uh, right now, uh, but I don't know okay. how, how much longer they will. <laughs> okay, so if you're yeah, so if you're watching and you want to grab the book, um, and we don't do a lot of a uh, book advert or any kind of advertisements generally, but for this one, definitely worth picking up. And if you can't find it, it'll be coming soon. John, I have to ask you. I mean, I know this is a big task, but look into the future. Anything, anything we should be looking out for? Or what's the next uh, project? Or are you still settling in there in Maryland? Yeah, so the next book, uh, the next book is coming out uh, late. Well, I guess around the middle of next year, uh, it's coming out in July with Baker, and it's a kind of a follow up to the Odyssey of Love, and the title is Why We Pray: Understanding Prayer in the Context of Cosmic Conflict. <laughs> so it's about this question of how could prayer make any difference, and and if prayer does make a difference, why does it seem so often that our prayers go seemingly unanswered? And so it's wrestling, wrestling with that question in this cosmic conflict paradigm. So I'm excited, wow. excited about that one. But but make sure you read God with us first. <laughs> so yeah, the Got it. Okay. All right. So read God with us. We're gonna do our best because we're again we're we're in the midst of a sermon series to get everybody through God with us, and then we'll be ready uh, for the next series. We're just gonna keep following. We're relying on you for all of our uh, sermon <laughs> content, John. So um, we'll we'll be ready in the mid mid part of next year. John, again, so that, great that's have... actually the the, the 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 most wonderful thing because the whole point of doing theology or writing is that it has can have an impact on 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 people that actually makes a difference and that is being used. And so that really warms my heart. So thank you. Thank you for for taking the time and effort to even make use of my work. Absolutely. And we'll look forward to more. And we're really, really thankful for this uh, relationship and for the great work you're doing, John. So we'll keep praying that uh, you continue on and uh, enjoy Maryland. Thank you. Thank I'll you. I'll be down for a ball game in April. We'll Sounds connect. Good. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, my friend. Blessings. Thanks for me. Blessings. Yep.